All right, now, what I'm going to preach about tonight is, basically, it's going to be a, a, an overview of the book of Jonah. Now, a lot of, a lot of people have heard the story of Jonah before, even if you don't know the name of Jonah. Most people, when they're kids, you know, you hear the story of Noah's Ark, and because it's all about the, you know, you hear about the animals going onto the boat, and of course, we know it's not all about the animals, but that's pretty much what you focus on as a kid. The same way with Jonah. The, the, peop, the thing that everybody remembers the most about Jonah is that he got swallowed up by a whale. And he was three days and three nights in the, in the whale's belly. And that's not what this whole book is about. That's one aspect of it. That's one story. We're going to touch on that. But the, the, the book of Jonah is only four chapters long. And there's a lot of great doctrine, a lot of great stuff that we can learn. So I'm going to preach. We're going to look through this whole book. And we're going to go through each of the chapters and see what we can learn from this book. And, you know, I kind of like going through every once in a while, we'll be pre I'll be preaching on different characters within the Bible. I'll preach on the Apostle Peter. Um, tonight we're going to be preaching on Jonah, and we'll pick another one. It's kind of good to get to know who the people are in the Bible, so that way it becomes a little bit more personal, and you, and you remember about the person as you read, excuse me, different books of the Bible or references to people later on in other books. So here, in verse number one, the Bible says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, starts right off saying that God is speaking to Jonah, and he has a message for him to preach. And this is what he says in verse number two. These are the, this is the command, this is the directive that God is giving Jonah. This is what God's telling Jonah to do. He says, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it. Crying means not like weeping crying, but crying and lifting up his voice like a trumpet, Preaching against the city, he says, cry against it for their wickedness has come up before me. This is the task that God has given Jonah. So God comes to Jonah, he tells him, he says, look, I need you, I want you, I'm directing you to go to Nineveh. It's a great city, it's a big city. And you need to go cry against it because their wickedness is, is come before me. Verse number three says, but Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the, the fare thereof, and went down into it, to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So God gives Jonah a command. He calls Jonah to preach. He's calling him to go out, preach this message unto Nineveh. But what does Jonah do? Jonah rejects God's word. He, he, he decides he wants to do his own thing. And he decides that he just wants to get away from God for a while. Now, we're going to see how important this is, but look, God has commandments for all of us. He has a will for your life. He has words that are written in the Bible that you need to follow and that you need to obey. Okay, for one, God commands us to be in church. God commands us to go to church and to, and to hear the preaching, to sing praises, to fellowship, to go soul winning, to do all of these different things. You can't, you know, you ought not to hear God's word and just decide, you know what, I want to get away from God. And people, when they don't go to church, that's exactly what they're doing. They say, I want to get away from the presence of God. Now, whether they're actually thinking that in their head or not, that's what their actions are showing. But we see here that Jonah thinks that um, he could get away from the presence of God, which is, which is kind of silly in itself. See, God is omnipresent. God is everywhere. The Bible talks about, you know, when, um, when David had it in his heart to build a temple for the Lord. And God basically tells him that, you know, do you think I need a place, you know, like a, a house or a building made with men's hands? He says, I don't need that. You know, God made everything. He, he's not bound by one building. He's not bound by some structure. It's not like he needs a place to live. God is everywhere. And to think that you could escape from the presence of the Lord um, is ridiculous. Now, in verse number two there, it tells them that to go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it. Now, we see early, later in the book of Jonah that that city is so big, it takes about three days to go from one end to the other end of the city by foot. If you're walking through the city, it's going to take you three days to walk all the way through that city to get from one end to the other. That's a pretty big city. And he tells them he wanted them to preach against it. And the city was so full of wickedness that he says, you know, it said, it came up before me. 
So God actually takes notice. Now, we all are sinners. We all have we all have sin in our life. But God took note of the wickedness that was going on. And then he says, look, this is, there's a lot of wickedness going on here. You need to go and you need to preach against this. Now, we're going to see God's reaction to Jonah's disobedience. Because right away, right at the very beginning of the chapter, God gives Jonah a command and Jonah just says, no, I don't want to do that. I want to get away from God. And be careful about this in your life with backsliding. You might get to a point where you say, I don't want to have anything to do with God. I don't want to go to church. You know, it's too hard. It's too hard to follow these rules. It's too hard to do the work that God's called me to do. I don't really feel like doing. It's not a positive message or whatever, whatever it is that you're coming up. I mean, Jonah here was given a pretty negative message to cry against the city. But you see, it may have seemed like a negative message, but the whole point of it was to get people to change, which is exactly what happens in this story. So Jonah, in his mind, is just thinking, that, like, oh, I don't want to go do that. That's not very fun. It's not very fun to tell people they're wrong. It's not very fun to spank your children. It's not very fun to rebuke people and to tell them that they're wrong and they need to change. But, hey, it's necessary. It's needful. And the whole point of doing such things is to change somebody's behavior, to change somebody's mind, to, to, to make a change in their life for the better. Because it's all, it, it all will be worth it if, you, if you're obedient. But see, God reacts, reacts to Jonah's disobedience. Look at verse number 4 in chapter 1. It says, But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. So, Jonah gets on board this ship, and he wants to go far away. He wants to go the exact opposite direction that God told him to go. He's trying to go to Tarshish. So he pays his fare, he pays his money, he gets a ticket to go on board this ship. So he gets on the ship and he starts sailing the other way. And God says, uh-uh. I called you to do something and you're going to do it. So God puts, is putting a roadblock up in his way, so to speak. He sends this great tempest. A tempest is another word for a storm. God brings a great and mighty storm to basically prevent Jonah from doing what he's doing. Now, we see oftentimes in the Bible when, when you see these great storms happen, these tempests it's an illustration of turmoil, right? I mean, when, if you're in the, caught in, the middle, in the middle of the sea, on the store, in a storm, you know, the waves are usually going really, really high. The boat's getting tossed about. There's rain coming in. There's, you know, you're worried for your safety, for your lives. These men were mariners. They were getting afraid, and they had to, to start dumping all kinds of the product that they were, that they were bringing with them to try to keep the boat just from... from crashing and from um, sinking. So it's a major storm. But see, this is what happens when you are disobedient to God's word. It may not be a physical storm that you're going through, but this is an, this is an illustration to show us that, look, you can go through some very, very serious, troubling times in your life when you decide to get away from God, when you decide to not listen to what God has for you to do, when you are disobedient to God's word, God can cause some major storms and some major turmoil to happen in your life. Right now, you might be very comfortable. You might have a lot of things. You might have a lot of food. You might have vehicles, a house. You might have a lot of things going your way. And amen, praise God for those good gifts that he's bestowed upon you. But I'll tell you what, if you decide to get away from God's presence, if you decide to go away from Him, He can cause a lot of turmoil in your life. He can cause you to lose those things. He can cause you to lose your health. He can cause you to lose loved ones. Don't turn your back on God and abandon Him because He might very well send a great storm into your life, a great tempest that will make you afraid. Now, that is how God responded to Jonah here. Now, we get down later in here, and the crew is trying to figure out what is going on because it's such a massive storm, and they're just saying, look, somebody's got to be responsible for this. You know, their gods or whatever, some gods upset because, because of something, and we need to figure this out. We need to get this right because we don't want to die on the ship. So they're like, they're casting lots. They're trying to figure out um, who's responsible for this mess. And, you know, they might have had a lot of superstitions, but, they, but basically they cast lots. It says in verse 7, And they said, Everyone to his fellow, come and let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. So they all agreed. They're just saying, look, this, it's, it's got to be this guy. 
this guy that came with us. And one thing that can be learned from all this is, again, with these, with these shipmen, be careful who you keep company with. Be careful who your friends are. Because if you just happen to make friends with somebody that is going against God's will, that is being disobedient to God's commandments, that doesn't want to have anything to do with God, that says, God wants me to go this way, but I'm going to go this way. If you have that type of person in your life, and that's the type of person you like spending your time with, and that's who you want to be around, hey, watch out. When God sends a storm into their life, it doesn't just affect Jonah. It didn't just affect him here. It can affect you too. You might very well be caught up in the storm because of somebody else. I remember um, back when I had quit drinking alcohol, yet still, still had a lot of sin in my life, and I decided, you know what, I still want to go out and hang out with my friends at the bar. But I'm not going to drink, because I'm, I'm not drinking anymore, but I'm still going to go into that place, I'm still going to hang out. Well, I'll tell you what, nothing good ever happens in the bar. Even if you don't drink there, there's still so much other sin, it's still sinful to go into that place. You don't need to be looking at it. You don't need to be looking at all the, all the garbage that's there, all the alcohol that they serve. You don't need to be hearing the filthy conversations of those that drink alcohol, and especially those that get drunk. You don't need to be listening to that stuff. And, like I said, nothing good ever happens in bars. You know, there have, there's many times there's going to be bar fights or maybe even somebody pulling out a gun and shooting people, which has happened multiple times here. People get in an altercation, they go out to the car, they get their gun, and they just start shooting into the, into the bars. And I'm not saying shootings can't happen anywhere, but I'll tell you what, when you start mixing alcohol in, in any situation, you're going to get a lot of stupid decisions being made. It's not a place where you ought to choose to go and spend time with. Just like the people who are in your life, you ought not to be choosing to spend your time around people who are going the opposite direction than what God tells them to do. And these people, these mariners, they let Jonah on board, they let him on their ship, and now because of his sin, because of his disobedience to God, now they're stuck in a storm. They're stuck in a huge tempest, possibly even about to lose their lives. Let's keep looking at this story here. Um, look at verse number 12. It says, and he said unto them, because they asked they ask Jonah, like, look, what is going on here? Why is this? And he said, yeah, yeah, it's because of me. And, uh, you know, he's like, I worship the Lord. The Lord made the, head, the, the earth and the sea. And he's like, he's the God of the earth and he's the God of the sea. And that made these people afraid because they already knew that he was fleeing from God. And they're saying, you're fleeing from God. And, and God's the one that made heaven and uh, the earth and the sea. And now he's brought this great storm upon us. So they asked Jonah, you know, well, look, what can we do to make this stop? Okay, what can we do to make it right? And Jonah says in verse 12, it says, And he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to the land, but they could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. Now, while well, I pause here real quick and point out that, you know, the entire book of Jonah is just full of symbolism. It's an amazing book. There are so many symbolic references, especially to Jesus Christ with Jonah and Jesus Christ being a prophet and prophesying of events to come. And um, there's lots of symbolism here. Now, we always want to be careful when you're looking at symbolic references that you don't misinterpret or misapply what's going on in the passage. You always have to, to take what you perceive to be a symbolic reference and line that up against other clear statements, clear truths in the Bible. We're getting that a little bit here in a minute. But um, we see here that God's wrath is not going to be satisfied until a sacrifice is made. That sacrifice was Jonah saying, no, you have to cast me into the sea. I have to be, I have to go. You have to sacrifice one member of your crew in order for everybody to be saved. And Jonah said, that's me. You have to cast me into the sea, which is exactly what Jesus Christ did for us. God's wrath is not satisfied for our sin, for the punishment for our sins, 
unless we accept Jesus Christ as that punishment, Jesus Christ is our Savior, He will make the, the, the tempest of God's wrath go away from our lives. He is the reason why we can be passed from death unto life. Now, the people on board this ship, they worked their hardest. They worked really hard because they said, no, nope, we don't want to do that. We're gonna, and they had a good heart, they had good intentions. They were trying to save Jonah. They're like, no, we don't want to throw you overboard. We don't want you to drown. We're just going to work really hard to get there. We're going to work hard to get to land, to safety, to get our salvation. And no matter how hard they worked, they could not attain that goal. They could not escape from God's wrath through their own efforts, through their own work. The only way to escape from that tempest, for that tempest to stop, for God's wrath to stop, would be for them to believe um, and to offer up that sacrifice. And Jonah was pictured here as Jesus Christ, of course. Now, verse number 17 here, right at the end of the chapter, it says, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And of course, um, chapter 2 goes into great detail on Jonah inside the whale's belly. And the prophecy of Jesus Christ's soul actually going to hell for those three days and three nights. And we're going to get into this if I have time. I'm going to push chapter 2 to the end of the, of, the, of the sermon. Because there's a lot there. And there's a lot in every single one of these chapters I want to spend time on. Now I'm going to try to get to all of them because we're doing a, a, an overview here. But we're going to see chapter 2 is, is completely dedicated to Jonah being inside the whale's belly. And um, we're going to see that at the end of the chapter. But go ahead and turn to chapter number 3 if you would. Because now basically what has happened is the men on board the ship, they did end up casting Jonah overboard. And as soon as they did, the storm stopped. I mean, it was just like, boom, it stopped. So everybody on, on the ship was like, wow, like, God must really be the God of heaven. And they made vows, and they made a sacrifice, and, and you know, so most likely they turned to God for their Savior. Um, we don't know that for a fact, but, but we see they definitely had respect unto the Lord. They gave him sacrifices, and because they saw immediately, just like, this storm stopped. There is no question about it. Jonah was right, and, um, and they can see that God was real. Um, based on their experience. Now look at, in chapter 2 then, or at the end of chapter 1, God had prepared a whale to come up and swallow Jonah. This great fish, he comes, he swallows up Jonah, and in chapter 2 we learn, or we see, what's going on with him in the whale's belly. At the end of chapter 2, it says, And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. So now we're going back to... to you know, the, the whales spit Jonah up onto the land. And we're, we're catching back up with Jonah. And it says in, verse number, in chapter number 3, verse number 1, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So, after everything's said and done, after all the trouble that Jonah went through, going onto the boat, getting in, in, the, in the tempest, you know, risking his life, being cast into the sea, getting swallowed up by a whale, going through all of this uh, suffering, really, that he wouldn't have had to go through if he would have just listened to God to begin with. After all of that trouble, God tells him to do the exact same thing. God's message did not change. God's will did not change. He said, no, I want you to go to that great city and preach against it. That's why I told you to do it before. I'm going to tell you to do it again right now. The second time I'm telling you, you need to go do this. Look at verse number four. It says, And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So now we see, you know, God got Jonah's attention. And Jonah listens the second time, and he says, Okay, Lord, I'll, I'll go do it. And um, verse number five says, So the people of Nineveh, believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. Now notice this. Verse number four says, And Jonah began to enter in the city a day's journey, and he cried, saying, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. This is Jonah speaking. 
Jonah's going through the city of Nineveh, and he's saying, yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. This is what he's proclaiming. Now, it's a message given to him from God. This is exactly what God had told him to preach. But look at what it says in verse 5. It says, so the people of Nineveh believed God. Now, when you hear the Bible read, when, when you have a preacher and, you're, and the preacher is preaching God's word, and it might be a warning in your life. It might be a warning like, hey, don't go into those bars and drink alcohol. Because God's word says, look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. He says, don't look at it. And if you go into the bar, guess what? You're going to be looking on it. When you hear these commandments from God, hey, don't just, just believe the preacher. When you hear it from God's word, believe God. Because that's the source of the Bible. That's the source of His words. Believe God like these people of Nineveh did. They recognized that it wasn't just Jonah's words that they were preaching. They recognized that they were God's words. They believed God. They believed that Jonah was sent there to, to, to preach this message from God. And it's important to note that because, hey, look, if it's just Jonah's opinion, if it's just my opinion, if it's just someone else's opinion, who cares? Who cares what you think? But if it's God's message, if God's the one saying it, then you better care. Let's keep, uh, let's continue on with the story here. Look at verse number eight. It says, right near the end of this, because the, the city, they believe God. They believe what's going on here. And the king makes a proclamation. He says, look, we're going to get right with God right now. And it says in verse eight, um, or in verse, let's just start reading verse 6. It says, um, well, even, let's just jump up. Let's just keep reading this chapter. Verse 5. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them, even to the least of them. So they put on sackcloth. They start mourning, right? That's what it means when they put on sackcloth. It means they put, when they put on sackcloth and ashes. It's, um, it's, it's something that they did to show that they're sorry, to show some repentance, to show that their mourning. Verse number six says, For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Now that's a pretty big deal. When you have the king of this entire, this entire land, right? The city of Nineveh. You have the king, he comes up, and he hears God's word. And he's able to humble himself. Now, kings were, were arrayed in royal apparel, right? Because they were showing that they were the king and they're really important and they're the one that makes the rules. The king takes off his robe. And, and he humbles himself. And just even in doing this action, he takes off his robe. He puts on sackcloth. He puts on ashes. And, and he sits down and he says, And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. He proclaims a fast. He's saying we don't want to eat. We're going to be in sackcloth and ashes. We're going to turn from our wicked ways. We're going to turn from our sins. We're going to try to get right with God and hopefully God will see this and he'll turn his anger away from us and he won't destroy us. But see, it starts with believing God and his word. This change would not have happened without believing God and his word, without, without just trusting that what he said was true, without trusting that what Jonah said was true, saying, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. If they didn't believe that, then there would be no point for them to change anything because they would think that everything's just going fine like it has been. So they do a lot of work. And we're going to see that here. Verse number 9, 
It says, who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? So the king said, look, who knows? Maybe God will, will, will repent. Maybe God will turn. Maybe God will change his mind about the course of action he wanted to take against us for our sins. Maybe he'll change his mind. Maybe he'll turn away his fierce anger that we perish not. But we don't know if he'll do that or not, but let's just get right and let's try it. That's the last thing we have to do. Let's try getting right with God. And that's exactly what happens. Look at verse number 10. And by the way, great verse if you don't know this, if you don't have this memorized, if you don't have this marked in your Bible when you go out soul winning, Jonah chapter 3, verse number 10, the last verse in, the, in chapter 3 of Jonah is, is something that you ought to incorporate in your soul winning with so many people these days that tell you that you need to turn from your wicked way to be saved, that people that tell you they need to repent in order to be saved. And when they say repent, they're talking about getting rid of sin in your life. Because it's not, it, that's a false gospel. It's a works-based salvation. Look, at, we're going to read verse number 10 here. It says, And God saw their works. That the people of Nineveh work. Absolutely. God saw their works. They worked hard. What did they do? What were the works that the people of Nineveh did that God saw and he had respect them to? Their works that they turned from their evil way. God saw their works. They turned from their evil way. They didn't want anything to do with their evil way anymore because they were afraid of God. The Bible says God saw their works. They're turning from your evil way is works, my friend. If people say, you have to repent of your sins, what does repent of your sins mean if it doesn't mean turning from your evil way? And yet you're going to claim to believe that salvation is by grace alone? And tell me that I have to repent of my sins to be saved? Well, I'll tell you what right now. I have not repented of all my sins. If I repented of all my sins, then I would not sin today. I would not be a sinner anymore. If I truly repented, if I truly turned from all of my sins, then I would cease to sin. By sinning, by de <laughs> by sinning, there's no way that, that I could say that I have repented of all my sins when I sinned. Because I obviously didn't. Now, you might have meant to. You know, in my heart, sure, in my heart, I'm trying to turn away from all of my sins. That's what I'm trying to do. That's what I would like to do. That's what God wants me to do. But that is not, I did not do that. I've not completed that action because I'm still a sinner. And that is also not what God has told me to do for my soul to be saved and go to heaven. Now, is that what he told, is that what these people did to, to save their city from being physically destroyed? Absolutely. This group of people in general, now does that mean every single person in this city stopped doing wickedness? I don't believe so. But you know what? By and large, the king, and, and he made a proclamation and said, look, we're going to turn from our evil way. God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. And what did God do? And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them. And he did it not. Important second half of that verse. God repented. Now most people that say, well, you have to repent of your sins to be saved, they don't even realize that God repents. Because they have this false idea that the word repent is just automatically bound to the word sin when it's not. Does God sin? Absolutely not. God never sins. God is without sin. God is holy. We have a holy God. God does not sin. So if God's repenting, Apparently, it's possible to repent of something that is other than sin because God repented. The word repent just means to change or to turn, right? You could change your mind or turn from something. God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them. Now, evil, again, doesn't mean sin. Evil means physically harming somebody. That's literally what evil means in the context here, especially in the Bible, when you do evil to someone, you are inflicting harm or damage or pain to that person. Now, was God planning on inflicting harm and inflicting evil on these people? Yes. It was a righteous evil. It would have been righteous for God to destroy the city, to destroy the people of the city because of their wickedness, because of, because of their disobedience to God. 
but he changed his mind. Now, when God repents here, did he do any work in that repentance? No. God did not even start to pour out any type of evil or any type of wrath on these people. He did not destroy their city. He repented, but this repentance that we see God doing had nothing to do with works. Important to understand that distinction because when the word repent is used, yes, in context, sometimes it is talking about turning from sins. The people of Nineveh repented at the preaching of Jonah. They repented and turned from their evil ways, but God calls that works. That is not going to save their soul from hell. All that did was physically save their city. The Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If you believe that a person has to turn from their sins or repent of their sins in order to be saved, you believe in a works based salvation by definition of Jonah chapter 3 verse 10 and you then you have a contradiction that you have to deal with in the Bible because God's word has no contradictions and if you believe that then you have just created a contradiction in the Bible for yourself there is no contradiction in the Bible because turning from your sins is works which is not a requirement to be saved over and over again, the Bible says, all we have to do to be saved is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in the house. That's what the Bible says. But let's continue on here. I don't want to spend the entire sermon on this point, although it's an extremely important point, an extremely important verse. Jonah 3.10, incorporate that in your soul winning because there's so many people today that have been lied to and have been deceived and think that you have to give up your sins in order to be saved, and that's works. Jonah 3, let's look at verse number 1. I mean, sorry, Jonah 4. Jonah chapter 4. We're going to see Jonah's reaction to God's mercy because God has mercy on Nineveh. God decides not to destroy the city. And here we see the really bad attitude of Jonah. Jonah chapter 4, look at verse number 1. It says, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. Now this is not the type of attitude you ought to have when God extends mercy on someone, especially on a city full of people. But Jonah was displeased. He was angry. The Bible says he was very angry. He was angry because God didn't destroy the city. It says in verse 2, it says, And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. So now it kind of amazes me how much boldness Jonah has to, to even to speak unto the Lord and to tell him these things and to say, see God, and this is where he's making up an excuse. This is why I didn't even want to go. He says, this is why I disobeyed. This is why I wanted to go to Tarshish, because I knew that you're gracious and that you're loving and that you wouldn't really destroy him anyways, that you would just extend mercy unto him. But that's false. God was going to destroy their city. The choice was up to them on whether or not they were going to turn from their wicked ways, which was the whole purpose of Jonah going to preach unto them. But would any of those people have turned from their wicked way if they did not have a preacher of righteousness going and telling them and exposing their sins? No, they would not. You see, these people, it even says that, that, that God said that... Um, at the very last verse, verse 11 of chapter 4, it says, um, persons that cannot discern between the right hand and the left hand. These people wouldn't have known necessarily that they were even in so much wickedness. 
They might not have even known it, and if you don't know you're doing something wrong, you dead sure aren't going to fix it. Why in the world would you change your ways if you didn't think there's anything wrong with them? If you think everything's going fine? They were going about their business, hey, everything's just fine. Without a Jonah to come along to preach, to preach out and say, no, you guys are wicked, you're wrong. God's going to destroy your city because of your wickedness. And Jonah's sitting here saying, see, that's why I didn't even go, because I knew you are just going to have mercy on him. I knew you weren't going to destroy him. Uh, no, Jonah. You didn't know. You had no idea what these people were going to do. You didn't know how they were going to receive you. You didn't know if they would actually listen to what you had to say. But God sent you to do this, and you just have to do it regardless of what you think you know about what they're going to do, whether you think they're going to change their mind or not. And that's the way we ought to deal with preaching God's word and going soul winning. If you say, well, look, they're not going to listen to me anyways. Don't have that defeated attitude. When you go out soul winning, when you see somebody, don't stereotype them and say, oh, this person's never going to listen to me. There are so many people I've gone out and talked to and have preached the gospel unto, and at first glance, because of their appearance, you might think, oh yeah, this person probably has want to have nothing to do with God or the Bible. Maybe they have a lot of tattoos. Maybe they look kind of funny. They have piercings. Whatever. Maybe they're listening to, to whatever kind of music, and they're just, you're just thinking, man, this, there's no way this person wants to know about God. And so many times that those are the very people that do want to listen. So don't ever just you know, judge a book by its cover, so to speak, and just think that you know what other people are going to want to hear. And besides that, you know, God tells us that we need to go preach the gospel to every creature anyway, so you just do it. Don't lean on your own understanding and your own wisdom as Jonah tried to do. Jonah tried to lean on his own understanding and say, oh, I knew that you were going to be gracious unto him. Yeah, but did God accept that? No, God brought the tempest into his life. God brought the whale to swallow him up for three days and three nights and to spit him back out on the land. And God told him, no, this is what I told you to do. Go out and do it. And that's what he did. So Jonah's here. We see him making excuses. Now, um, verse number five, skip down a little bit in Jonah chapter four. Look at verse number five. It says, so Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow." So he might see what would become of the city. So now he's like, God didn't destroy the city in those 40 days. So now he's like, okay, I, I just want to see what happens. I'm going to see you know, if God does end up destroying the city. And so he goes out of the city. He builds a booth. A booth is just like a tent, right? Just like a little makeshift tent. He builds this booth, and it says um, he sat under it in the shadow. So it's basically just a tent to provide them protection from from the sun, from, you know, he's giving them shade, and um, he's looking to see what happens. Verse number six says, And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. But God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day and it smote the gourd that it withered. Now, <laughs> It's really interesting what God's doing here because he's trying to make a point with Jonah. Jonah seems to be really, you almost might want to say bipolar, okay? Because this guy is going through a lot of emotion here. It says in verse number one, it says, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he was very angry. So here we see Jonah, he's very angry that God didn't destroy Nineveh. He's very angry at that. And then we see when this, when this gourd comes up, see, God makes this big gourd to grow overnight. And, you know, it's real hot outside. He built this booth, but it doesn't quite cut it. And if any of you have ever been in a tent before, when it's been hot outside, I know I camped once in Mexico, and we pitched a tent, and it's like, man, as soon as that sun was up, yeah, you're inside a tent, but, like, the sun beats down and just kind of cooks the, the tent that you're in. So it's a little bit better than being in the direct sunlight, but it's still really hot and really uncomfortable. But then you have this gourd blocking you. And then you also have the protection of the tent, so I'm sure that felt a lot better. It says here, so Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. Exceeding, I mean, it's something he was really happy about. Look at verse number 8, it says, And it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished in himself 
to die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. So here we have, I mean, Jonah's kind of going through all these extreme emotions. He's very angry, and then he's, you know, extremely happy when this gourd comes up. And then he's just so upset now when the, the gourd dies, and there's this east wind. He's just in, in, in trouble again, and he's just saying, it's better for me to die than to live. The Bible says that we need to be content with such things that we have and, and be happy with whatever situation we're in and to take it patiently. Look at verse number 9. It says, And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. And see, this is, the, this is the attitude, again, that, that Jonah has, even talking back to God, saying that, I am right to be angry, even unto the death. I, I, you know, I should be angry about this. Verse 10 says, Then said the, said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for the which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle? So he uses this gourd to get through to Jonah. He uses his gourd to say, you know, look, you are so happy when this, when this gourd grew here. He says, you didn't make it grow. You didn't plant it. You didn't do anything. It just came up, and then it dies, and now you're all upset over the gourd. You have pity on this gourd that died. Yet, you're angry that God didn't destroy these people, human beings, that it says there were six score thousand persons. A score is 20. Six score, six times 20 is 120,000 people. 120,000 people in that city. That's a lot of people. 120,000 people that Jonah was angry about that God didn't destroy that city. God's making this point to us. Look, you're showing pity on this gourd. You didn't do anything to this gourd. It came up and provided you some shade, and now it's dead. It's up in the night. It's gone in the night. You're showing pity to that gourd, yet you're not showing pity to these people of the city? You're not thankful that I didn't destroy this city? And he's trying, trying to, um, to point that out. Now, one of the verses that came to mind as I was studying the book of Jonah, just studying Jonah in general, really interesting character. He was definitely used as a man of God. He was a preacher of God. But for whatever reason, he, you know, he's kind of... Uh, Seem kind of kind of emotional just just going through this um, these extremes and getting angry, being soon to anger, which you know he ought not be so angry. And, and I don't know, maybe he's not soon to anger. You know, from what I get from the from the Bible from Jonah, with what's going on here, he just seems to be kind of too rash in making his decisions. But um, one of the things that came to mind in, in 1 Corinthians nine. Verse number 16, the Bible says, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. So Paul's saying here, look, we are required to go out and preach the gospel. God's commanded us to go out and do that. We are his servants. We need to do this. And he's saying, look, woe unto me if I don't go out and do it. Okay? Woe. That's extreme sadness and grief. He's saying, woe unto me. I'm going to have woe if I don't go out and do this. He says, but if I go out and do this willingly, if I decide, you know what, I want to serve God. I want to do what's right. I want to do these things. He says, hey, I'm going to get a reward. That kind of makes the choice pretty simple. I mean, we should want to serve God. We should want to do what he has us to do. Instead of having a, you know, in a way forcing us to do this stuff, let's, um, let's be willing to do this. Now, let's flip back real quick. I got a little bit of time. Let's go back to Jonah chapter 2. I wasn't sure how much time we we're going to have. We've got just enough time. I won't spend too much time on this. We're going to read all of Jonah chapter 2. It's, a, it's an amazing chapter. We could, we could preach an entire sermon easily out of just this chapter with the prophecy that we see here. Back to Jonah chapter 2, we see Jonah in the whale's belly. And what happens here, just to give you a little bit of insight before we start reading, it kind of goes back and forth between Jonah um, 
expressing the prophecy of Jesus Christ being in hell and you know, flip-flocking between that and him actually being in the whale's belly. And we'll see that here in Jonah chapter 2. Verse number 1 says, Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. So in verse number 1, Jonah's in the fish's belly, in the whale's belly, and he's praying unto God. But then look at verse number 2. It says, And he said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Now was Jonah literally in hell? No, he was in the whale's belly. Of course, he wasn't in hell. But he's saying, and this is where we start going back and forth between the prophecy and what's literally going on in the whale's belly. But this is his prayer. It says, um, Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, right? Again, back to Jonah, literally being cast into the deep, the deep being the ocean. He was cast into the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Right? So he's in this, in this tempest. The waves are crashing over him. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. Again, talking about the seaweeds. Wrapped around his head, he's in, he's in the whale's belly. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. Now, again, we go back here. Going down to the bottoms of the mountains is not going in the whale's belly. That's, that's talking about um, you know, being in hell there. And the earth with her bars was about me forever. So, forever, I think it means in, in, in time, right? Like, like you're there forever. But, it could all, but another thing it might possibly mean is that, you know, the earth with its bars was about me forever. If you're in the center of the earth, everywhere you look, it's, you know, the earth is enclosing you around every, in every direction always, infinitely, because there's, there's no way out. You're stuck in that cord. The earth with the bars is about you forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption. Again, corruption is in, um, is in hell. Now Jesus it says his body saw no corruption. His physical body did not decay. It did not corrupt. But it doesn't say that his soul did. His soul went to hell. It says you brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. Verse 7, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Now, Jonah got humbled by this experience, obviously. By being in that whale's belly, it was, it, was, it was simulated hell. If you think about it, it cannot be very pleasant. You know, you, you see these stupid cartoons or whatever where like Mickey Mouse or somebody's swallowed up by a whale and he's on a raft and he has a light in there and, and everything's like really not that bad. It's just like he's in the ocean and it's just, it's just a little bit dark, but he's got a light. That's not the way it was for Jonah at all. I cannot imagine it was a very pleasant experience whatsoever to be in a whale's belly. First of all, it's going to be completely dark. You are going to have just zero light if you're inside of a belly, inside of an organ of an animal. You're going to be having no light whatsoever. That is a type of blackness and a darkness that is described in hell where, where you, you can't see anything. And it's a, it's a darkness that you can feel. Okay, not only that, in a, in a belly, you know, I'm sure there's going to be some kind of digestive juices and things in the belly. He's not in, a, in any type of a raft. He was all alone by himself. He's got seaweed being wrapped around his head. Whatever the things are, whether it's dead fish, whatever is inside this whale's belly is in there with Jonah. And uh, I'm sure the whale's not sitting stationary either. The thing's probably moving around, right? So you, you're in total darkness. You're getting knocked around. 
you know, he's got seaweed wrapped around his head. He, it probably doesn't smell very good. Inside of a whale, well, I've never been there before, but I don't plan on ever being inside one, but I can't imagine it smells very good. And he went through a lot. And of course, this also gives us this great symbolic reference to Jesus Christ. And just so we, it, to prove to you, turn to Matthew chapter 12 real quick. I'm going to be wrapping up here in, in just a second. Matthew chapter 12 proves to you that this was a prophecy spoken about Jesus Christ. And that is not talking about Jonah actually going to hell. I've heard someone, I've heard someone say that before. Thinking that, oh, well, maybe Jonah went to hell. No. That's not what this is talking about. Jonah was a prophet, and he was, and he was showing um, that this prophecy was written about Jesus Christ. There's no question in my mind about that. Matthew chapter 12, look at verse number 39. It says, But he answered and said unto them, Jesus Christ speaking, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. Jonah, right? That's who Jonas is. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus Christ right there just spoke the word saying, look, just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart, the heart of the earth, the center of the earth, where hell is. Jesus Christ said himself, that, I mean, there would be no other purpose for pointing back to Jonah if Jonah was not a foreshadowing, was not a prophecy about Jesus Christ going to hell for three days and three nights. And chapter 2 is dedicated to showing us some extra detail about that event. Acts chapter 2, 25 says, For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt, thy, wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. And then three verses later, the Bible says, Therefore, being a prophet, see, here Peter is quoting the Old Testament, he's quoting, the Psalm, he's quoting David in the Psalms, He's quoting this verse, and he, and he ends up saying, Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. And he explains what that verse means in verse 30. It says, Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne, he, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ. What is that talking about? What is that psalm talking about? What is that verse talking about, that will not leave my soul in hell? It's talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. And the reason why I'm even bringing this up is because there's so many people out there today that believe that Jesus Christ did not go to hell while he, while he was dead and buried. That his soul went to some place that's like, you know, um, like a purgatory. Or something. I don't know. He went to some place that's not really torture and torment, but he went and he preached on the people in hell and told them how wicked they were or something, even though they're being tortured and tormented. And that it was the nice part of hell. It was the cool part of hell. It's nonsense. Hell has never given a positive, a positive mention in the Bible one time. Not once. Not once is hell a positive place to be. Yet people want to make up this doctrine and say, oh, well, Jesus didn't go. The, it blows me away because the, the logic is so simple. Look, if you deserve to go to hell to pay for your sins for all of eternity because you've broken God's commandments, if that is our punishment, and Jesus came, he came and took our sins on himself on the cross, you're going to tell me that when he died, and it says that he went to hell, that he didn't pay for those sins the same way that we would pay for those sins in hell. Even though that would be our punishment, and the Bible says he took our punishment for us, he said he took, you know, he is the propitiation for our sins. He died in our place, yet somehow he didn't have to pay the punishment that we would have to pay. It doesn't even make any sense. And we have all this scripture backing us up that says, no, Jesus Christ went to hell. And why would he worry about his soul even being left in hell if it wasn't that bad of a place? If it was just like Abraham's bosom and everything's just great and we're getting along just fine down here. No. 
Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. It was a bad place to be. It feels so simple to me, saying, to, to even have to bring it up and say, you know, no, hell really is a bad place. A lot to learn from the book of Jonah. Lots of great symbols. I didn't even go into all the symbolism. There's a symbolism of, of Jonah being asleep in uh, chapter 1. He was, well, there's all this tempest and this storm, and Jonah's just sitting asleep, and there's like, you know, wake thou sleeper. And um, it reminds me of the story. I think there's another picture of Jesus Christ being asleep in the ship when, um, when there was a, a, a storm and a tempest going on. And um, they, they ran to him and woke him up and, and said, you know, Master, we perish. And... Um, and Jesus rebuked the storm and, 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 and it obeyed him and it became silent, still. And um, there's so much symbolic references. Jonah, one of my favorite books of the Bible, I know it's one of my children's favorite books of the Bible, I like that story where he gets swallowed up by a whale. But um, anyways, hopefully you learned something tonight and go home tonight and, and study some more of this, of this book. It's a, it's a short read, it's a short book. You can get through the entire book pretty quick. And um, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the Bible. We thank you for the book of Jonah, dear Lord. I pray that you would please just, just help us to, um, to learn from these stories. God, I pray that you please help us to learn that we ought to just obey your commandments immediately, that we shouldn't put them off, we shouldn't try to flee from your presence, dear Lord, which is impossible to do. I pray that you please help us to stay in church, help us to love you, help us to grow closer to you and to not to try to to disobey your commandments and to do um, just something of our own heart and to think that we know what the outcome is going to be ourselves and use that as an excuse not to do what you tell us to do, dear Lord. But um, we, we love you and we thank you for your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.